<laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Christensen. I'm the cyber practice lead for Gray Matter. Uh, I've got over 20 years of experience in cybersecurity with the last 15 years primarily focusing on production environments. Uh, so I'll start off with talking about risk and resiliency and what do we mean? I think it's always nice to kind of start off by defining what we're talking about. So when we talk about OT cyber risk, we're talking about loss, disruption, or damage. Uh, what is the potential risk of it? You know, what, what are the odds that it's going to happen and how will it impact, you know, critical operating systems? And then last is what is resiliency? I think this is a question where we really started to find more and more, more often lately, is it's, it's the ability to, to identify, protect, detect, and respond. And I think the key point to this is the respond aspect of it. How can we bounce back? How do we how do we how do we act under uh, pressures of a, a specific incident or attack? So. Around the industry, we're hearing more and more conversation talking about risk and resiliency and what are the thoughts on it. And I think the, the big takeaway that I start seeing more and more is it's uh, that attacks are going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's more of a matter of when. Uh, for the longest time, we, we believed a lot of different myths would protect us, whether it be air gapping or uh, complete segmentation of systems or, you know, just not keep letting anything be online. You know, a lot of these myths we're starting to see be debunked over time and understanding that, you know, now we've kind of got a, a balance between practicality and security. Uh, my favorite quote is this one on the bottom right, which is, uh, if security were all that matters, computers would never be turned on, let alone hooked into a network with literally millions of potential intruders. Uh, a lot of times when I'm brought in to talk to a customer, uh, to a, a partner, or even just a presentation, uh, the first conversation comes on, there's a, a sliding scale of extremely secure and extremely practical. And I ask every customer to kind of find yourself on that balance. You can be extremely secure, you know, unplug everything, but that's not very practical. Or I can be very open and very practical, but I'm not very secure. So it's always a key component to finding where that balance belongs and where you sit on it. So kind of a, a few of the histories of OT cyber attacks. And I, I always like this slide for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is that very first attack. Uh, a lot of people seem to believe that OT threats only started coming about 2010, 2011 under Stuxnet. But the oldest incident I could find was actually 1982. There was a uh, pipeline attack. Uh, basically, uh, the Soviet Union was trying to build a natural gas pipeline across Siberia. Uh, the United States and most of their allies, NATO, did not want this to happen, so they created a Trojan. And specifically what this Trojan did is it turned off all the safe operating settings on valves and compressors and turbines. And so when they all exceeded their, their threshold, they blew up. Uh, so it was kind of a unique in the fact that this was, you know, 36 years ago, 30, you know, 38 years ago. It's, it's been such a significant length of time to show that we've had a long maturity in OT cyber attacks. Uh, the next attack I always think is kind of important is the very last one on this list is the German nuclear station. And the reason why I think this one's pretty important is I think I think we all think of nuclear stations as the most air gap siloed secure infrastructure you can get. And yet just two years ago, uh, a reactor in Germany was completely uh, attacked to the point where they had to take it and scram the whole reactor and take it offline uh, for a significant cost. And the way they circumvented all the security measures was USB sticks. Uh, Configure virus, there was 18 USB sticks that were found within the reactor that were used for configuration changes and firmware updates. And they found Configure virus on these USBs, uh, which is interesting because in the IT world, we remediated Configure virus almost 10 years ago, 2009, 2010 timeframe. Uh, it's long ago, you know, there's antivirus scanning, there's all these other tools in, on the IT side of the house that completely eliminate it. But yet in the OT, we still see Configure pretty consistently. Uh, I've seen lots of customers over the last year who are still dealing with Configure viruses attacking some of their key uh, systems and operating environments. So if you look at tax by sector, so this is the 2016 ICS search numbers. Uh, I, I think this one's kind of important because I always look at, you know, you start off with energy. Energy's just the nature of the business and the nature of where they operate. They're always going to be one of the higher level uh, attack vectors. But if you go down through it, you see manufacturing is number two. Uh, commercial facilities like buildings. And then last, you know, the fourth one is water and wastewater. Uh, I think that's pretty interesting if you look at the, the top four, how diverse they are. And you also look at the fact that it, it, 
there's no you know one safe vertical across the board almost every type of production environment is a target these days and there's a significant number of that share the risk across you know their assets so just kind of bringing one of the more common attacks there was an attack this year and the reason i bring this one up is this, the city of atlanta happened in march of this year and the reason i bring this one up is one is it completely shut down the city of atlanta for about two weeks uh, all the all the utility, all the city operations, police couldn't even write parking tickets for two weeks. Uh, now, it sounds like a good thing in some ways, but honestly, the big thing is it was so propagated across so much of their environment that they completely shut down the airport. They shut down. They went to manual operations on their water systems uh, and even their public transportation system was had significant delays. The airport was shut down. And, you know, as of now, I think the top, we're looking at the cost of right around five million dollars for one incident. Uh, a couple things that came out of it that we learned, you know, or relearned lessons, honestly, is uh, one that if they want to attack and shut you down uh, from a ransomware standpoint, it's very hard to prevent it. But having a, a policy and procedure for recovery is almost as critical as preventing it. So being able to spin it back up and not lose two weeks of downtime is kind of key component. And the second thing is something I'm seeing more and more is customers reach out to us and they start talking about how to build plans, one of the things you look into is you know, what is it going to take to recoup from a, an attack like this? Do we have a method for purchasing Bitcoin? Because in this case, the uh, attackers actually requested Bitcoin. And I, I know quite a few of my customers who have ran into this issue. They don't have a procurement method for Bitcoin. So, you know, how are they even going to pay if that incident comes up? So I've had to help customers write incident response plans for something like that. Uh, and then lastly is the fact that how interconnected all their systems were. So the watershed system was shut down. The, the ticketing system for the police was shut down. The airport was shut down all from one attack because all their systems were so interoperable that they just kept passing the virus across. So when we look at maturity model, kind of gray matter, what our philosophy is, we follow very closely to the NIST maturity model. And the idea behind it is it's not that you need to achieve all the way to five right away. But over time, you want to show growth. And so you start off with, can I identify my risk and my critical assets? Uh, I think that's one of the first things when we come in and we look at is we ask for that spreadsheet, that Excel sheet that has your IP addresses and a list of all your PLCs. And, and I think probably about 70% of the time it's accurate, but you know they're not real confident in it. So that first is, do we know our assets? Do we understand where our risks are? You know, do I know the version and patch levels? Do I know the manufacturer? And if I have that information, do I know the threats based on that information? Uh, the next thing we move on to protecting your assets. Uh, and so you're looking at firewalling and segmenting my network and hardening my communications. Do I have a way to make sure that if I have a critical asset that it's protected and hardened from other, uh, you know, riskier, untrusted sources? Then detect threats. You know, you move on to detection. So now that I've protected and I've identified risk, if an incident happens, how quickly am I alerted to a, to an, uh, an attack? You know, being able to alert and find out that I'm being attacked as it's happening rather than waiting till it shuts all my PLCs down and shuts down all my production line. It's a kind of a key component to showing maturity. You know, how well I can respond to recover is kind of the last step. You know, is can I respond to an attack? If an attack happens, what is our response plan? How are we going to react? And if it does happen to take a critical system offline, a critical asset, how quickly can I recover that asset? You know, do I have redundancy? Do I do I have cold spares? Do I have ways of completely getting back up online quickly with a minimal impact to my production? So one of the more recent guidelines is you look at the American Water Works Association with the EPA came out with some guidelines. And I think they're really good because they follow really tightly to NIST. So they kind of apply to almost any operational environment. So we're going to lean kind of heavily on this one. But they kind of come with, you know, what are the guidelines? You know, the first is, do you have an accurate inventory? Uh, uh, the, as I talked about that Excel sheet, how often we come on and they have it and it's kind of accurate but the details are a little light and it might have changed since you know PLCs have been switched out or we've had an integrator come in. So I think that's kind of the first thing is, do I have an accurate inventory? Do I know what my assets are and how they communicate on my network? Second, do I have network segmentation and firewalls? Is my process network and my business network clearly defined and separate? And I even recommend going a step farther and separate your layers of your process network. Don't have your Windows-based machines on the same segment as your embedded systems like PLCs. 
you know, having true segmentation across your environment. The reason you do this is every hop is a difficult way for something to transact across your network. You know, it, whether it be a malware or a hacker or just an internal problem, if it has to go through additional hops, it's more checkpoints. It's it's more difficult for it to spread and impact the the totality of the infrastructure. Then the next one, secure remote access. Uh, oftentimes we come on site and vendors mandating remote access or uh, they even require it for support. And we see things like, you know, log me in or we see things like team viewer and they're completely circumventing all security rules. They're giving complete access to the network and they're doing it out of the convenience factor, but they're not realizing they're opening themselves up to a whole new level of risk. So if you accept the fact that remote access is coming or that you need to support it, having a secure remote access and having an approved method of uh, accessing the information is key. Then establishing role-based, you know, oftentimes we basically just give everybody a username and password and don't establish, do they need access to everything? You know, having different levels of roles, you know, I don't necessarily want, you know, someone who specializes in, you know, my my HVAC system to be able to access my, my pumping equipment on my water facility. You know, I want to make sure that I, I can segment and control who has access to what and be able to separate those those roles and responsibilities. Uh, strong passwords, right? You know, I think we've all kind of learned over time with all the attacks and a lot of the things that have happened in, you know, in, in the technology world the last few years is you can't just have password one, two, three, but beyond that, add in, you know, uppercase, lowercase, add in symbols, you know, make it a little bit harder because every, every addition to the password that's required is a, a level of complexity to breaking the password. Uh, maintain awareness of vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm a big fan of ICS cert and the simple fact that I remember the days before when vendors were not real responsible with disclosing and they kind of kept their, their their vulnerabilities to themselves. So at least with ICS cert, there's a, a, a wealth of data on what vulnerabilities are out there. I encourage you if you're particularly, you know, uh, committed to a spe specific vendor, you know, whether it be ABB, Rockwell, GE, Honeywell, Siemens, go look and see what their their potential vulnerabilities are and see how they might impact your environment or, or bring in someone to look and be able to identify the CVEs, the common vulnerability scores, to see what the risk is to your environment on some of these things. Develop and enforce policies on mobile devices. That's a big one these days. Uh, you know, a few years ago, it would have been unheard of to talk about a mobile device in a production environment. You know, you, there's no way you, you're going to deal with a, a tablet or a phone doing anything with my environment. Now, as we push for asset performance management and we push for advanced analytics and we push for more and more user in the hand, you know, control in the user's hands, we're asking, looking at mobile devices. So there's ways to allow mobile devices on your network. But what's even more important is make sure you have policies around them. Even if you ban them, make sure it's very clearly stated why you ban them. Uh, had a walkthrough with a plant on an assessment, and it was very clear that they want they were completely 100% air gap. They were a very firm believer in this. As we were going through and we were analyzing the network, we noticed a couple publicly addressable de devices on the network. So as we walked through the plant, we finally scoped it out. It turned out multiple people were using the SCADA terminal, the USB ports on the SCADA terminal to charge their phones. Because of that simple lack of knowledge, they were completely bridging the gap of security and they were jumping over. And their answer was, we didn't know we weren't allowed to do this. They saw a USB port, their phone was low, they just plugged it in. It's an awareness thing. The, and then next, when you look at you want to make sure you implement a training program. This is kind of tied to the previous one. Do your do your employees, do your, your internal resources, do they understand why you're doing things? Because a lot of times they just think of security as a, a disabler to everything they want to do, as opposed to an enabler to ways of doing it correctly. So making sure that they have an awareness and training program, why you don't plug, charge your phone on a SCADA terminal, you know, why we have complex passwords, uh, why we don't do sticky notes or write the username and password on the whiteboard, uh, make it, you know, making sure you control access to panels, you know, you know, a training and awareness program, you know, an ongoing program will get, allow security to be taken in the hands to the day-to-day -day people. And then next is if you've got the day-to-day -day in involvement and buy-in, I encourage you to get executives involved in cybersecurity. Uh, I, I would say probably a good half of the cybersecurity programs that I've seen fail or have problems was because there was not someone at the executive level sponsoring or driving, you know, the cybersecurity program. So getting them uh, involved when those roadblocks come along, when you need people to all play on the same team, having that executive awareness and, uh, and sponsorship will help benefit your cybersecurity program. 
And then, you know, tenth, you want to really implement measures to detecting compromises and develop a cybersecurity incident response plan. Uh, very simply, is you know, you don't want to wait till your PLCs are broken to find out you've been exposed. You don't want to wait until the ransomware comes through and you need to pay Bitcoin. You want to find out early in the cycle as possible that you've had an exposure, that something's acting out of spec. I definitely encourage devices that record baselines and understand what normal looks like in your environment. Because one of the big advantages we have in OT for, from a cybersecurity standpoint is we don't want things to change. If it's working well, don't change it. So that static mentality that we have in our networks is an advantage. So look for changes, look for anomalous behavior in your environment, and it'll benefit. So you can say early on, and when I see something behaving abnormally, for example, I see a device doing a reconnaissance scan, a PLC, a, a engineering workstation, it's not supposed to be looking for scanning the network. So if it starts scanning the network, that's an, a, a strange behavior. I want to be able to find out why it's doing that. A lot of times that reconnaissance scan is the first identifier that you have an exposure on a system. So pre-plan, what do I do before, right? So you first you look at, you know, have you identified an adequately secured critical data and assets? Very simple, right? Straightforward. Have I identified what my critical assets are? Uh, you know, a lot of times you want to look at, you know, where the weaknesses are. What, what am I dealing with? Is it a legacy OS? If I've got Windows XP out there, have I got protections in place around Windows? You know, those type of things. You want to be able to identify those things first and then put controls around them. And then start looking for what, what are the anticipated threats, right? So if it's a vendor bringing in a USB stick that might be infected, do you have a procedure and controls around how USBs are entered into your environment? Uh, I've seen CISOs go as far as super gluing USBs on the OT environment just to prevent anyone from plugging a USB in. So, you know, don't necessarily have to go to that extreme, but really understanding, you know, where the, you know, where the anticipated threats might come from and where you're most vulnerable and how to control and protect it. And then I also am a firm believer in doing assessments. And I'm, I think of assessments as you don't do it one time and say, I checked the box, I've done an assessment. I look at it from time over time, compare results from previous assessments to new assessments. Are you showing maturity? Are you showing growth? Are we fixed issues? So for example, if I come on inside and say, you need to have a patching policy. The next time I come in a year or two years, you know, I look, I look to see, is that, path is that patching policy now implemented? Are you got controls around it? You know, things like that. You start looking for the maturity so that you can actually see and grade yourself. Am I improving and mitigating risk t time over time? And I'm a firm believer assessments need to be cyclical. They need to be scheduled, you know, have them annually or biannually or every three years, whatever it might be. But over time, look to see how you're doing each time versus the previous engagement. Look for areas to remediate. And you don't have to look at an assessment from I have to do my whole infrastructure every year. You can take a sample size. And the one thing I've learned over my years is that sample size is pretty reflective of the whole environment. If I find issues at one, I'm probably going to find similar issues at another. So, for example, if I find TeamViewer all over one pumping station, I'm pretty sure I'm going to find TeamViewer at other ones. If I find, you know, uh, Windows XP machines that are sitting publicly addressable, I'm probably going to find those in other places. So a lot of times just taking a sample size will at least start to address a lot of the risk. Uh, ensuring patches are up to date and employing encryption. So this is kind of an interesting one for us in the OT world. We don't patch very well. It's just a tradition in the OT world. It's very impractical to do this a lot of times. So you don't necessarily have to always be patching, but have a policy around your patching. If it can't be patched, do I have controls to protect the device? Am I encrypting you know, communication and access to, to unpatched systems? Uh, always go back to the Windows XP machines. Are we, do we have controls? Do we have r limited access? Are they obfuscated? Are they non-discoverable devices? These are all things you can do to start making it and mitigating the risk on the XP to make it safer than it would normally be. Are we addressing vulnerabilities caused by legacy or outdated systems? So that's right back to the Windows XP, right? So when Microsoft stops support, doesn't mean we stop using Windows XP. In fact, that's still pretty prevalent in, uh, in production worlds. So looking to see, do I have controls in place around my Windows XP? Am I protecting them from being attacked? Do I have a long-term strategy for upgrading it? You know, Do we have a plan to look to do things like this? So all these kind of things you need to be in your long-term plan and you look to see bit by bit, can I improve my cybersecurity for parts of it? Do I budget for you know, full-on upgrades and you know, moving on to more modern supported systems? So having those things in place early will help you develop a, a a, a good risk plan. And then the other is 
do you have a good explanation to give clients, constituents, and customers? And this is something that's a lot of times people don't look at the risk from the reputational standpoint. Uh, if, you, if you start with the assumption that attacks can happen or attacks will happen, if you start with that assumption, your, your thought is, what what are you going to have to explain if an attack happens? Uh, one of my favorite CISOs uh, sitting through, we had a long conversation on disaster recovery, and we went through everything. We checked off, and I said, well, what happens if everything fails? And he came back to me, looked me in the eye, and he says, if the board comes to me and says that, it's a resume-generating event. And I looked at it, kind of, he goes, I'll be getting my resume out and looking for a new job. Because that's his thought, is like, if it gets through all these things, and I still can't stop it, I need to, I, I, I have not done my job. So do I have an explanation of what we've done and what we can't do? So if you mitigate all the risks, at the end of the day, you can still be defeated, but at least you can say, look, here's where I've accomplished my successes. Here's where I've lowered our risk profile, and here's where I've been successful in defending our assets. So once again, the EPA, they actually have a, a nice little worksheet, and I just put this up here because I want to kind of show it basically follows along with what we just talked about. The reason why I like this is it, it's got the not only the notes, but the date completed. So as you check off and see what you've done, have you gone through these things? Do we have an answer for these pieces? Do I have a good, you know, effective cybersecurity program? These are the kind of things that, you know, if you go through, it, it's it's great for kind of a uh, you know, mnemonic device to remind you, hey, we have we addressed this issue? Have we looked at this thing? So and year over year reviewing last year's answers to this year's answers, you know, knowing that it's always a, a journey, not a destination from a security standpoint. So I talk a lot about IT versus OT and, you know, and and I'll start off by saying, first of all, the most successful cybersecurity room finds a way to bridge the gap. They converge the two groups in some way, shape or form from a security standpoint, uh, mainly because a lot of the best practices for cybersecurity already sit on the IT side of the house. The problem is there's a priority shift when you go to the OT side of the house. So understanding that priority shift affects a lot of the programs and ways we develop, uh, you know, our systems on on the on our on the production environment. So you start with IT. The primary focus is traditional CIA confidentiality, integrity, availability. That's primary priority priority focus. So if you look at it, they're worried about emails and you know healthcare information and credit card data, all that information. They want to protect the data itself, the bits and bytes. When you come to our side of the house, the first thing is is we're safety concern. You know, if a valve doesn't open and it exceeds thresh threshold, that's a that's a safety, that's a risk issue, that's a physical action that I need to be concerned about. So that's kind of one of the key first things we worry about. Next is availability. If if the lights aren't coming on or I'm not producing product or I'm not keeping the faucet running. That's a big problem. So availability is a high, high priority for us. You know, I'd almost put availability well above integrity and confidentiality. They are concerns, but availability is probably the primary focus of what we do. So when we look at security from our, our standpoint, we always got to keep in mind availability is our key primary with safety next to it. So you look very closely to, for example, patching policy. I can't shut all my systems down for every, you know, the first Tuesday of every month for patch Tuesday. It's not practical. It's not going to happen. So I may have a cumulative window where I take a maintenance window and do all my patches for six months, but put controls around it. So I have a passing policy, patching policy that says I protect my infrastructure and I get to a patching point. Or I may never patch it, but I put rules in place on how that system is accessed. You know, who can see it? Is that network? Is that device network discoverable? You know, I put controls around that system. And then also when you look to do it, do I have redundancy? If something fails, how quickly can I get a redundant system up and running? You know, do I have a plan for that in place? You know, a lot of times we build redundancy at the low level, right? We have PLCs that are ready to go. You pull them off the rack, you put it in, and you go. You know, it's already pre-configured, ready to go. You've already got that redundancy there. But sometimes as we get higher up the, the food chain, we lose a little bit of that redundancy mentality. And sometimes it's not always practical, but it, but it helps to have some plan in place where you have the actual physical redundancy in place and where you don't outline what are the steps for places we don't have redundancy. So getting started, you know, what am I going to do? So the first thing is start off with an inventory. You know, do I know my assets? Do I know their patch level? Uh, you know, do you know? Don't allow a machine to talk directly to one on the business network. Put a DMZ in place. Uh, one of the biggest things we do when we do an assessment is I look for publicly addressable devices. You know, anything that dials up to the internet is a big risk to the OT. So I look for every single communication path that's externally facing. Then I start looking for 
parts of the network that touch touch other networks, whether it be trusted or untrusted networks, I still look for anything that transacts across my production network to the next. Then have I got segregation in place? You know, you know, start segregating your network. Look for ways of doing this. You know, we've, we're a big fan of overlay networking here, mainly because it comes back to that availability mindset. I can set my overlay networking and segmentation on top my traditional networking. But even if you're deploying VLANs or more traditional segmentation methodologies, it's a good access to a bare minimum. Make sure that your operational network does not touch your business network directly, that there's a segmentation, a DMZ between both networks so that they pull into the DMZ and push out of the DMZ, but don't directly communicate with each other because that's the easiest way to expose a network. And then remote access methods. Do I have remote access? Do I have a, a plan in place for how people can remotely whether it be a VPN, whether it be you know, some other solution, you know, crypto keys, whatever it might be, but do I have a method that allows people to rem have remote access and how flexible is provisioning in that method? You know, can I spin up a new vendor quickly and do we have change control in place for when I do? Uh, one of the uh, first projects I worked on for the oil and gas industry was on a rig where they kept having a problem where the navigational vendor kept messing up uh, the, the power conversion side of the rig and they couldn't figure out what was going on because the power conversion integrator kept saying it wasn't them. So once we did the delineation of uh, the network and segmented across, even within the process control networks, we, we started noticing a, a, a much higher uptime. And that's the key to what we do, right? Is can we get more out of these devices? Can I get more uptime? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I look at cybersecurity as another example of unplanned downtime, which is the killer on, in our world. So making sure you have that in place is always helpful. Establishing roles. And this is real important. You know, do I have admins? Do I have people who have, you know, who, who, who control? And do I log their access to the systems? As I, that previous example, the only way we found out it was the navigational integrator is we went back through the logs and we had to, we manually went through and checked and finally figured out what was going on is they were overlapping and they were causing issues and conflicting messages on the network. So having those logs allowed me to go back in and figure out what was going on. But also the first key is the logs are a lot of times indicators of behavior that's anomalous. So looking at logs and seeing, you know, failed login attempts and, you know, you know, communications out, you know, any, any type of session data, it, it's very useful to be able to look and see things that are anomalous behavior, things that are odd. Like if I see a bunch of failed logins, you know, 100 or so to the network from an external source, I know someone's trying to get in, whether it be, you know, a bad actor or just an internal resource who forgot his password, I need to be able to track that down and figure out and validate which it was. Uh, requires strong passwords. We've kind of covered that. It's pretty straightforward, right? You you want to have, you know, longer passwords with uppercase, lowercase, and symbols in it. Pretty standard across the board. Uh, Stay aware of vulnerabilities, uh, as I talked about before. You know, follow ICS cert. Look to see what my vulnerabilities are. Do I know what my CVE score is and what my risk profile is? Uh, and then enforce policies. Uh, it's always a big one, whether it be for mobile devices or in general in an environment. You know, uh, I can write all the policies in the world, but if I go on site and no one's enforcing them, it's kind of pointless. Uh, I go back to the username and password on the whiteboard. I can write all the great username and password policies you want. I can make the, the most strict, strongest. But if I walk the plant floor and I go into the control room and I see the username and password up on the whiteboard, you defeated everything I've done. So I've not enforced. No one's enforcing that policy. What, you know, and, and same thing on mobile devices. Uh, the the habit we get is, well, this is my phone. And I I can do what I want. But if it's accessing any resource on the production network, it needs to follow the same guidelines as any other asset. You know, developing a cybersecurity training program is pretty straightforward. Even if it's once a quarter or once twice a year, uh, even yearly, you know, some level of measurement of awareness. And we're very common to the IT traditional cybersecurity program, but on the OT, we very rarely get a training program around that. You know, understanding why we do things, why there's segmentation of the network, why we don't just you know, dual home devices that connect to the business and process network. You know, these are these are kind of awareness things that you let people know so that as they develop and things add to the systems, you can be made aware of what's going on there. And then lastly, as you look at, you know, that maturity model, you know, are we monitoring network intrusions? You know, do we have a plan to respond? You know, I think that's a, a key one these days. You know, are we looking for, you know, potential exposure points in my network? Are we running pen tests? Are we running vulnerability assessments? Or are we running continuous monitoring where I'm tracking what's happening on my environment 
as it happens? Do I have a connection back to the SOC, you know, the Security Operations Center? Uh, am I using some type of SIM, you know, uh, like Splunk or Logarithm? Am I, my, am I looking at the alerts? Am I looking at the behaviors of my network? And am I quickly responding to issues in my environment? So gray matter. So where we look at some of the offerings we do in Kaibe Align, right? So the first is we look at a lot of times is the architectural assessment. So looking at your architecture, do you have redundancy? Do you have segmentation? Are you following best practices such as NIST 800? You know, look at the current state, you know, where you are today, what can be implemented, but also look at a future state, you know, as you develop out, as you get cloud and you get analytics and you, as you interconnect more of your devices, you know, having a plan in place early on is very valuable. So having that architecture ready to go and have it designed and have a, a security mentality in place makes it much easier than trying to bolt on security after the fact. Uh, risk assessment, just what it sounds like, coming in and identify first all my assets, you know, version, patch level, manufacturer, and then compare them against known vulnerabilities, you know, knowing threats, going out there and be able to come back with, here's things you need to, you know, uh, you know, you may need to be patching this system because there's a very high level critical exploit out there. Uh, you, you look at things and rank them. You may also find out that you have a lot of low criticality, you know, low CVE score type threats. So things that you kind of, you don't want to focus a lot of energy and effort on, but you want to be made aware of, you know, so uh, th those type of things, uh, policy and procedure audit, you know, helping you actually create the policy documents. Uh, very common. We get asked to take IT policies and procedures and come in and work with them and make them fit the OT world. Uh, patching is always the one. It's probably one of the hardest we hear is the patching policy usually on the IT is patch everything as, as soon as you can. Uh, it's pretty similar on the OT. The difference is that soon as you can part, you know, patching once a month is much easier on the IT than patching once every couple of years. And if you're not patching, do I have a rule set around what has to be patched and what has other controls in place? Uh, network segmentation, whether it be, you know, layer two, layer three firewall rules or VLANing or, you know, things like, you know, advanced tech network technologies like identity defined network and HIP, you know, having a, a segmentation of networks, whether it be high level macro segmentation or low level micro segmentation, segmenting out you know, your critical assets and protecting them from attacks is kind of a key component. And then an annual review. And, 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 and as I said earlier, it's like, this should be cyclical at least. You know, are we, every year, are we looking at, are we doing the best? Are we applying to current best practices? Whether it be American Waterworks who came out with the new standards in, in May, uh, IEC 62443, NIST, ISO, there's tons of great standards out there. You know, you tend to want to take one and modify it to how it applies to you, but making sure year over year you're showing, are we improving? You know, are we applying the standards? Are we are we are we better than the last time we did a data assessment or an exercise in cybersecurity? Showing that growth over time. So how to respond to a cyber incident? You know, this is uh, kind of NIST recommended from an OT standpoint. Uh, you know, the first thing is. is you don't turn off the computer or reboot the system because that may causes a whole different level of issues. It's more important you disconnect the computers from the network. You, know, you separate them, you, you isolate them. Uh, then, you know, making sure that you've reached out to any virus or your security service vendor and find out, you know, here's how you're infected and diagnosing what the potential uh, infection might be, whether it be Configure, which is a very Windows IT PC based attack or Stuxnet, which is a very OT, you know, you know, specific vendor attack, you know, understanding and identifying that is kind of key to knowing where to look for other places of exposure. Uh, as they did in Atlanta, the other part is, you know, move to manual operation and assess the potential damage. You know, understanding where it is, make sure you look for it. Uh, one of my more common things that have come up a lot recently is I have a customer who has a couple Windows XP machines that continually get infected with a virus. Uh, we found out, you know, every time we rebuilt it, every time we put it back on the network, within days, it would be reinfected, less than a week every time. So one of the things we did is we obfuscated the traffic. We, we put an overlay network on it, encrypted all the traffic to and from isolated it from everything else and the, and the system because it's no longer discoverable and it's no longer found it's not been infected it's been up and running for six months with no infection and this was you know after a, a two-year period where every single week it was getting infected with a specific virus so being able to have that plan in place and how to be able to go forward uh, it did distribute advisories uh, you know that's it's interesting there's a wealth of knowledge and information you know ICS puts out a lot ton of vendors put out a lot of information making sure that those who 
are affected or potentially could be affected or aware of potential attacks, whether it be, you know, a vulnerability release or a manufacturer issue or whatever it might be. But making sure those advisor alerts get to the people who are actually day to day operators is important. And then, you know, identify methods to scan IT assets. And I, and I, and I, I use this term cautiously when we talk about scanning. Uh, there are there are scanning methods on the IT world that you would never do in the OT world. So when we start talking about scanning, I'm talking about looking at IT assets. And you want to be very careful what type of scanning you're doing because uh, PLCs can fall over with a basic NMAP scan. So you don't want to pull that, that information back. So being able to find methodologies and tools that allow you to see your critical assets and scan your network and see what's available is, is key to kind of automating the process for you know doing an assessment or an audit of your environment. So network asset mapping. So we're big fans of uh, doing this through an automated method. We, we, we support and promote a product called CyberX. Uh, the big thing this does is a couple of things. One is it's a, we look at a passive methodology. So it sits off a span port or a network tap and it mirrors traffic into the device. What's key to this first thing is that first it identifies all the OT assets. Uh, it'll pull back the firmware versions. And because it's got the manufacturer and firmware level, it then compare it against known vulnerabilities, both publicly disclosed and disclosed, as well as ones that they maintain internally through their research organization. And it comes back with a risk score. And I, I'm a big fan of risk scoring because if I make changes to my environment, I want to know, did it improve or de you know, decrease my risk or did it increase my risk? So I want to be able to make those changes and see how that's impacting my risk score because it's constantly running this. I can identify you know, my vulnerable devices, those that simply just need improving, and then also those that are actually secure. And then I can try to make sure that I'm lowering that score, that I'm, I'm incre increasing my, my protection of my environment. So the other we look at is overlay networking. So I talked a lot about segmentation. And the reason we're big fans of overlay networking is it, it, it allows you to keep your operations up and running, allows you to segment and protect your network and obfuscate traffic without requiring a complete configuration change to your whole infrastructure. So it, it, uh, if you look up, there's a technology called HIP, and this is tempered networks. So what it does is it sits on top of your, your traditional network, that hence the term overlay. It, if you look at the way networks were originally designed is peer-to-peer, -peer, the way the internet was originally designed was, I'm a computer, this is a computer, we trust each other, we share each other's information. Uh, we built on that technology as we built networking out. It's very trusted. And inherently, that's a problem when it comes to securing an infrastructure. If you're on my network, I must trust you. The other aspect of it is an IP address and MAC address, I can be very easy to spoof. So if I can act like I'm a different computer, but I'm a, a trusted IP address, I can get very easy command and control functionality on your network. So the way we remove this is because those things are portable, well, we assign them a non-portable permanent crypto ID. So by assigning an asset, this permanent crypto ID that sits with the IP and MAC address, I can then say this crypto ID is only allowed to communicate these ways on my network. So if I don't have this crypto ID and I plug on the network, I can't discover anything else on the network. So your Windows XPs are now cloaked and hidden from the rest of everything else. Also, inherently built into HIP is encryption, military grade encryption. So as all communications happen on the network, I can't sit in the middle of this traffic and in intercept and play man in the middle because I can't even see what's on this traffic. So it's kind of a key component is one is I can obfuscate and cloak all my, my network assets, but then I can also prescribe how they communicate on my network. So if you look at it from a perspective of, I have a group of PLCs, they're only allowed to get read commands from a certain group of, of DCS or HMIs. I can prescribe that that's all they're allowed to communicate with and lock out all other communication. So unless the instructions come from the approved uh, you know, DCS, uh, yeah, no changes can happen on my environment. And because all that traffic is encrypted, I can't even see any other assets on my environment. This is really advantageous when you look at things like vendor control. I can micro segment out and when a vendor comes on site, I can assign them and say, these are the PLCs you need to be working on. I can give you access only to these PLCs. And when he plugs in, that's all he's able to see on the network. And in inverse, because we can assign crypto ID and the networking underlay doesn't become, is not as a priority other than for transport. I can also use this to manage remote access. So that same crypto ID can sit on a phone, it can sit on a PC, it can sit on a laptop, it can even sit in the cloud and I can assign that device where it's allowed to access anything on my network. 
So even if I'm remoting in, if my crypto ID says I'm only allowed to see a certain group of machines, that's all I'm going to be able to see because it's all been obfuscated and hidden from me. A little bit more on this and the idea that behind it is uh, the fact that it comes in a lot of different form factors. And when we start talking about one of the big values and we talk about resiliency, one of the great things of this system is because the underlay network becomes transport. What I can now do is then I can put a device that has, for example, Ethernet as its primary and I can have cellular as a backup. So if my Ethernet fails or I'm getting a, a, an attack, think of a denial of service on my Ethernet, I can fail over to my cellular. And because I'm failing over to a completely different network infrastructure, I completely circumvent any attacks. But because my crypto ID is still controlling what assets I'm allowed to see, I don't have any impact on my production. Even one better is I can actually have multiple SIM cards and have multiple cellular networks in one device. So if I'm having a problem on one cellular network, whether it be an attack or just a, a, a quality of service, I can fail over to the other so I can go from AT&T to Verizon with a very low gap in between. It also allows me to inter inter interact with regardless of the form factor. So if I want to sit up in cloud and I want to access AWS, I can actually have a crypto ID sitting there. I can have actually an appliance, a, a switch in front of my assets, or I can even have it a service on a Windows machine, all communicating with, through, with the conductor, getting its permission for where I'm allowed to see and access on my network. So I talked a little bit about this, but it just kind of more enforcing, you know, the, the history of networks uh, early on in the 1970s. Like I said, it was peer to peer. I have one computer because you're able to communicate with me. I, therefore, I have to trust you. And we built on that. Right. So in the, in the 2000s, we basically said, well, if I can see you, you've got an IP address, you've got a Mac address. I can filter most of those. But I, if you're on my network and I can see you, I can I communicate with you. So moving on to that almost trust but verify mentality, right? If you don't have a crypto ID, you can't even see me, let alone communicate with me. So everything becomes a very locked down, encrypted environment, very trusted, protected network. Uh, just more, a little bit more of, you know, high level on this, just talking about the ease of use with it and the deployment and understanding that it's pretty much a drag and drop interface. So I can list my assets, the crypto IDs, and then I determine how their communication paths work. And they can't even see any other communication paths unless they have permission from the conductor to see other aspects within the system. So we talked a little bit about intrusion detection and being able to move to detecting anomalous behaviors. Uh, talking a little bit about what we what we look at and what we we see as an advantage this is first is continuous non-invasive that you know it's, it's kind of a mouthful but the biggest thing is uh i want to be able to always be looking at, in, at what's going on in my environment i want to see any behaviors that might change my environment and one of the most basic things i can look at is rogue devices if all of a sudden a new device shows up on my network and starts communicating with other devices on my network, that's kind of a key factor, whether it be a, a, a loud device, a provision device, or if it's uh, you know an, an attack. I want to be able to identify it and see it and be aware of what's going on in my network. So being able to have that continuously checking for changes in my network infrastructure. But also, I also want to look at con, you know the situational awareness. As I talked about earlier, these networks are static. You know, we can take advantage of that static nature by looking for any changes outside. You know, on the IT side, they're very dynamic. They're, you know, DHCP and everything else. They have to deal with always constantly changing. So it's much harder for them than it is for us. I don't want to see a bunch of new devices. I don't want to see changes in behavior. Uh, even more simplistically and granular, if I have a, a system that I only allow read access and it all of a sudden goes to write access, that's an important change. I want to know that. So those are the kind of things you want to be able to see by continuously monitoring, mapping the network and looking for that behavior. I can see those things. And then because it's agentless, this is kind of important. It sits off a spam port off a managed switch. So it's very, it's very clean. It doesn't deploy, touch any other infrastructure on the network. It's not going to impact production. So it's kind of a key thing. It's, it's not going to interject traffic. It's not going to change commands. It's not going to introduce latency. You know, these are all kind of keys impact to that availability priority. And because it doesn't do any of these things, it doesn't require you know, an agent to be deployed. Therefore, it's not going to cause risk to the environment. Okay. Oh, excuse me.
excuse me, jumped ahead. Okay, so a couple of standards. I talked about these a little bit. And uh, I just, you know, kind of the big ones, NIST is the, the DHS, you know, the, the sponsored, US sponsored uh, cybersecurity framework. Uh, NERC-SIP is a good, pretty good standard at the first time. Uh, uh, you know, the power utility industry kind of try to apply cybersecurity standards to production. Uh, IEC 62443. Uh, it's another really good standard We're all around production environments, and it's really assigned to what your role is within uh, the operational environment, whether you be vendor, manufacturer, uh, whatever it might be, kind of understanding each of those and the, each section kind of appropriately applies. And then lastly, kind of my last kind of wrap up here is understanding a production environment, kind of what do we look at, right? So what are the what are the ways we approach it? You first you look at your people, right? It's very simple. Do my people follow best practices? Do we understand what our threats are? Then the process, do I have the right policies in place? Are we going through a good login? Uh, I talked a little bit about the security versus practicality. You know, where do we wanna be on that scale? Do we wanna be ultra secure and not very practical? Or we wanna loosen it up a little bit and allow us to be more, you know, more flexible, but still have controls in place. And then technology, are, are you invested in the right tools? You know, do you have the right firewalls? Are they integrated and working together? Uh, have you tried things in the past that didn't work? Documenting what doesn't work is just as important as documenting what does work. So finding out what works and how those things and understanding and learning those lessons from them. Okay. With that, I'll open it up to any questions.